present the very first annual Leonard Grossman Memorial Lecture. I'll tell you more in a minute about uh, who it's in honor of and uh, why we came up with it. Um, but I just want to start by welcoming you all. Thanks for being with us. Uh, I think we're going to have a really exciting and interesting lecture to listen to, and then we also have a party after. So the reason we're here today is because of Leonard Grossman. And I know that there are people in the room who knew Leonard, uh, and everyone who did not, uh, I can tell you with all my heart that um, your life would have been better if you had. Leonard Grossman was one of the founding board members of the Sugar Law Center, and a truly extraordinary human being. Um, although he made his living not through his passion, he gave tremendous amounts of time and energy and love and money to causes for social justice and civil liberties uh, throughout the state of Michigan. He never stopped working for people in need, for education, and for a broader understanding of human dignity and justice. I was privileged to meet Leonard uh, six years ago when I first started speaking to the Sugar Law Center board about serving them and helping them. They were in something of a crisis at the time. And from the very first day that I met him, Leonard became an advisor and a mentor and just this loving, pure person that, that you could talk to on any matter. He was very practical, a very down-to-earth person, but at the same time just deeply thoughtful and, and there's no other word than loving for the way Leonard went about his work and his days. And when Leonard passed away uh, last January, it was a tremendous loss, of course, to those of us that are part of the Sugar Law Center community, but also uh, ACLU of Michigan, Carrie Moss is here, and Ralph Simpson and others that are part of that community, which was also, um, I don't know any better way to put it, but strongly supported in every conceivable way by Leonard Grossman. And uh, I think it took all of us a while to figure out, well, how do we pay tribute to this astonishing person and how do we keep his memory and his values alive as we progress? Uh, and I'm really pleased that the Sugar Law Center Board of Directors uh, unanimously decided this past summer that, that a really important thing to do was to honor Leonard's values in terms of human dignity, but also his commitment to sharing ideas among the broadest possible group of people and to educating the next generation. And so uh, the Sugar Law Center Board created both a Leonard Grossman Memorial Fund, which will be used to support uh, Sugar Law's efforts to educate the next generation of public interest lawyers, uh, and also what you are here for today, which is the annual uh, Leonard Grossman Memorial Lecture. Every year it will be given open to the public, free of charge, on a topic and by a leader who is clearly associated with and driven by the values of human dignity and social justice that drove Leonard Grossman. Uh, and so I'm very privileged today to introduce the first annual Leonard Grossman Memorial uh, Lecture. Uh, which is uh, an eminent attorney known in Michigan and nationwide. Uh, we have Michael L. Pitt with us. He's a partner at OG. I don't know that I'm going to get the whole name right. Let me see if I have it in my notes. Pitt, McGee, Palmer, Rivers, and Gold. I would have done it right. You see that? <laughs> Five names is not that many. Uh, Michael was one of the founding partners of that firm, and it's a, a really fabulous firm that does civil rights litigation as well as uh, a lot of employment litigation, I'm sure you can all imagine that employment litigation on the side of plaintiffs uh, is something that draws this firm very closely to Sugar Law's uh, purpose and values as well. Uh, and part of the reason that we wanted Michael Pitt to speak today on the topic of citizen activists and movement lawyers and their relationship to one another, this necessary symbiotic connection, is because Mr. Pitt worked very closely for about 12 years with an extraordinary team of attorneys, including I think several of the partners at his firm, but also others as well, on a really extraordinary case, Neal versus Michigan Department of Corrections. And I have to imagine that that will come up at least somewhat in Michael Pitt's speech, so I won't give away all of it, but I will say that it was uh, a case that really, I think, underlines the most basic uh, premises of human dignity. Uh, this was a situation where hundreds of women in Michigan prisons were routinely and consistently
consistently sexually abused and raped by guards and the people who had power over there every move, every day, were taking advantage of that power in the most egregious way. And so uh, Michael and the rest of the team were victorious in uh, achieving not only a substantial uh, financial compensation, a recovery of $100 million to be used for these prisoners, uh, but also apologies from people representing the state of Michigan, and that was a supremely important victory. So uh, before passing the mic over to Michael Pitt, uh, I do want to say that Michael's commitment to social justice and public interest law is expressed not only through his own work every day, but also through the generous support that he and his wife, Peggy Goldberg Pitt, provide for legal education for the next generation of public interest lawyers. And I know that they have provided extraordinary support over the years for Wayne State University Law School, which is Michael's alma mater. Uh, Michael is not someone who looks for the limelight for his personal donations, but I, I feel a need to single out the most recent example of his and Peggy's commitment. Uh, this summer, they made a very substantial donation in order to enable Wayne State to sponsor a postgraduate public interest law fellowship, a year-long fellowship of a recent grad from Wayne State. Uh, and so thanks to that generosity, Phyllis Kasabiaden, who is here in the front row, waving at everybody, uh, is spending a year at Sugar Law, uh, contributing to what we do and developing her skills in advocacy for social justice. We're deeply grateful for making this possible, and uh, part of my justification for saying it and making it public uh, is that I think it's really important for people to know that this example is out there, and we really want Michael and Peggy's example to spur others to similar uh, kinds of fellowships and other commitments in the future. So I'm gonna pass the mic to Michael. There's one more thing I wanna say before then, which is to remind folks that today we are honoring not only Leonard Grossman and Michael Pitt, but also the dedication of 28 Michigan citizens who have stood up to challenge in court the Emergency Manager Law, Public Act 4, uh, of which I think probably everyone in this room is aware, but if not, you have plenty of chance to learn more this evening. Uh, I hope that folks will stay after the lecture. Uh, there will be a Q&A after the lecture, but after that, please stay and join us. We're gonna have a reception, delicious hors d'oeuvres, live music, and we will present an award to these 28 people who have stood up to challenge the state. Uh, and it's something really admirable, and I hope that you'll stay and pay tribute to them with us. And now, please welcome noted civil rights attorney, Michael Pitt, who will speak to us on the topic of movement lawyers and citizen activists Essential Collaboration for Justice. Thank you, Tova, and uh, thank, you, excuse me, thank you all for coming today to uh, honor Leonard Grossman. Uh, uh, Leonard um, and I had a 35-year association. Uh, I met Leonard back in the 70s uh, through my contact uh, with the ACLU. And uh, uh, Leonard was uh, the, the guy who would often get me unstuck. When I would get stuck in a problem, Leonard would help me out. Most notably, uh, my partner uh, Peggy, my wife and partner Peggy, and partner Kerry bought a building in downtown Royal Oak and we had to make a decision do we go big or small with this building that we bought and I was on the fence I was stuck and Leonard had a tremendous real estate experience uh, I called Leonard he came over spent a couple hours with me going over the plans got me unstuck he said go big you won't be sorry we went big we weren't we're not sorry we, we got in at the right time, and our building's doing just fine. And Leonard it was really the behind-the-scenes kind of a guy. Uh, he was an early investor in the Metro Times, and you know, we're all thankful for the Metro Times because it does set forth a progressive agenda, uh, something that the other media uh, fails to do more often than not. And a lot of thanks goes to Leonard Grossman 
coming up with some of the seed money and some of the impetus to get that Metro Times going. And the list goes on and on and on. Um, and uh, I know Audrey's not here, but she's a, became a good friend. But I think, is Abby here? Abby, you want to stand up? You're ready, oh, guys? This is her. See you, so I didn't this is Leonard's daughter, Abby. Thank you very much. And uh, we're really, I'm very, very honored. <laughs> speaker for this tremendous memorial uh, event that you've set up. I want to start out uh, by uh, giving attribution to somebody I normally would not give attribution to, and that's we just filled it, <laughs> of all people. But he's, he's written a, an interesting book with an interesting title. The title of the book is How I Got This Way. And, and I think it says a lot about a person's life. How did you get this way? How did I get this way? And he, of course, talks about the 30 people who made a difference in his life. And I want to share with you some of the friends and some of the people I encountered over the last almost 40 years now as a lawyer uh, to help you understand how I got this way. Let, um, and, and what I'm going to uh, talk about is some of the successes that I have had in what I would refer, refer to as high impact civil rights litigation. This is the type of litigation where civil rights cases make a difference not only for the individuals involved in that particular suit, but also the population at large, how, how through litigation change can be realized. And um, my story is about how I was able to do this through collaboration. Collaboration uh, occurs in this arena, and I, in my opinion, after all the years of doing this, I think it's an essential ingredient for successful high impact civil rights litigation. Uh, Williams International this is the first case I want to talk about. This, this occurred back in the uh, 1980s. Uh, a bunch of uh, peace protesters would uh, camp out at Williams International. They made cruise engines, the missiles that uh, are used uh, by the uh, government to uh, perpetuate war against, you name it, but the missiles that are used are made right here in Michigan. The engines that, that go into those missiles are made by Williams International. And a, a law clerk by the name of Deb Choley, and I'm sure many of you know her, uh, uh, worked for our office. And uh, she failed to show up a couple days in a row. And I, I said, where's Deb? Oh, she's in the Oakland County Jail. <laughs> What's she doing there? Well, she got arrested based on her activities at Williams International. So I went out to the Oakland County Jail and visited my employee and friend, Deb Choley, and she told me her story. And I said, this is outrageous. This, this can't be right. And uh, the, so we got involved. Bill Goodman came into the case. Uh, Bernie Goodman came into the case. Ken Mobile came into the case. <coughs> Randy Carfonda came into the case. And I'm sure I'm going to say, I'm sure I'm missing a few, but those are the principles, and uh, we we challenged what was happening. And the case was in front of Judge Thorber, and and um, he um, he wasn't a very unusual judge, to say the least. He uh, he enjoyed terrorizing these peaceniks, and he would bring them into his courtroom in shackles, shackled to murderers and other <laughs> interesting folks, and would have them appear in front of him about once every two days, and he would say to them, now, if you promise never to go out to Williams International again, I will let you free. And uh, each of these people would shake their heads, no, I'm not going to make that promise. This is an act of conscience. I'm going to stick by my conscience. I can't agree to do that. Sheriff, take him back to jail. Uh, I would appear in front of him and argue 
why this was an illegal detention. The law doesn't permit you to do this, Your Honor. His answer to me was, forget the law. And it's on the record, he actually said in court, forget the law. I'm going to order them to promise never to do it again or they're going to stay there forever. Well, the Court of Appeals ordered them released. And uh, we took the case to the Supreme Court of Michigan. It was actually Ernie Goodman's last argument before the Supreme Court. Did a wonderful job. The Supreme Court ruled. Yeah, I think it was close to an unanimous ruling that uh, it's a First Amendment right not to promise to engage <laughs> in certain uh, acts of civil disobedience and that the judge could not uh, order them to uh, state that they would agree never to uh, violate their, their own consciences as a, as a uh, basis for detention. Uh, and uh, that case uh, st still stands on the books and it's a real tribute to Bernie Goodman's advocacy, which was a wonderful thing to watch. Uh, Julie Hurwitz and I who represented about 45 plaintiffs back in the late 80s, early 90s in the Detroit Coke case. Kerry Moss came, uh, came on board as the director of the Sugar Law Center just around the time we were trying a case in front of Judge Gilmore. And that case involved the, the actions of a despicable individual by the name of uh, Don Crane. Remember Mr. Crane? He was the worst. Uh, he was lawless. He ran a, 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 a coke plant in southwest Detroit. He contaminated his workers. He contaminated the people around him. And after 11 years of uh, poisoning everybody, he declared bankruptcy. Uh, and fired all his workers in violation of the Warren Act. So we, we brought the suit, and it uh, was in front of Forrest Gilmore, and uh, they, um, they did everything they could to thwart us, including lying to the court about documents and other types of uh, discovery that should have been made av available to us. Notwithstanding the, the lies, uh, we won the case, uh, and we filed a motion for sanctions, and Judge Gilmer threw the book at this guy like you wouldn't believe. I mean, the sanctions against him was about $10,000, if I recall. It was a huge sanction. And um, he left Detroit. He's now, he still runs a coke plant in Tonawanda, uh, New York, and uh, did an internet search uh, on him. And he's still around, and he's still doing these despicable acts, ruining people's lives, and running away as soon as he gets sued. Uh, next, I want to talk about the Detroit Edison case. Uh, this, this was a uh, age and race case against Detroit Edison that started in the early 1990s. Uh, the, the founders of this case were myself, uh, my wife Peggy worked on the case, and uh, Jeannie Meyer, who at that time was not a partner of the office, but later became a partner in the office. Uh, we um, represented about 1,500 Detroit Edison employees who claimed race and age discrimination. The um, company reached a settlement agreement, and there were two components to the settlement agreement. One was that they would uh, change their human resource policies and programs and enter that, those changes in the consent judgment. Jeannie and I worked with the Edison lawyers for almost two solid months preparing uh, programmatic changes in the way Detroit Edison operated. And some of those, promoga 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 <laughs> some of those programs still remain today in, in place. Uh, the second part of the settlement agreement was an arbitration where damages for the 15 people would be assessed. Edison agreed to a high-low, which means that, that under no circumstances would the class receive less than $15 million. And under no circumstances would the class receive more than $65 million. As soon as Detroit Edison agreed to the high-low, we said to Detroit Edison, 
that we want below. But they were going to have to pay it regardless. They refused to pay the low. We said, well, we're not going to go any further with this case, and we had reached impasse. Two pastors were called in, uh, Lonnie Peake, some of you may know Lonnie, and Edgar Van, a very prominent uh, reverend in our community, came in and talked sense to the Troy Edison. And Edison agreed, in order to resolve the impasse, that they would fund our case. So they, monthly, they would write us checks so that we could hire 15 lawyers to develop the 1,500 cases. And after a year, they had paid to us almost a million dollars of their money so that we could prosecute the case against them. And we had uh, an arbitration panel imposed. And Dick Sobel was one of the arbitrators, and I think we Dick and a civil rights attorney in town. And uh, Jim Kerrigan, who was a former uh, Supreme Court Justice of the Colorado Supreme Court and the United States District Court, and Gil Casales, who was a former EEOC chairman. After a month of litigating, the arbitration panel came up with an award of $45 million. So, so essentially, we had taken Detroit Edison's million dollars and used it to get a $45 million award against them. And uh, so that, you know, that, that's a unique experience that most lawyers don't, <laughs> don't enjoy. And, uh, uh, you know, 1,500 people were uh, not only given substantial awards for the discrimination they endured, but also received promotions and other types of equitable relief. We also, um, in, in that case, again, was a, a product of collaboration. In addition to Peggy uh, and Jeannie, uh, Carl Edwards and, and um, Alice uh, Jennings were on the team, Bill Roy were on the team. And again, the lawyers worked uh, as a team over, and that, this particular case lasted about six years. We worked about six years together in order to achieve the result that we obtained. Uh, next, we had uh, cases against Ford Motor Company. Ford Motor Company uh, had a program where they would evaluate its managers by using uh, a ranking system. A ranking system in employment means that they would compare one employee with another and rank them one through 100. And those who were on the top got the highest merit increase, and those, those people got the A's and the B's got the medium merit increases, and then the C's got the lowest. And this was a uh, uh, program that was developed by Jack Welch from GE, who was, who was very, very uh, prolific in his advocacy for this program. Well, as it turned out, the uh, younger people who were ranked would be grossly disproportionate, disproportionate on the high end, the A's, and the older folks who, were, who had 20 or 30 years of service in the company would be grossly disproportionate on the C's. So using statistics, we argued that there was age discrimination. Uh, we joined together with Ron Riasti, another attorney that shows up later, and Sue Helen Eisenberg, uh, and uh, we pursued the case in Wayne County Circuit Court, and we uh, got uh, the Ford Motor Company to the point where they had 500 of their managers, not, not their hourly or salary people, but their managers who had joined the case and were fighting the corporation. There was widespread publicity. Jock Jock Nasser, who was the CEO and chairman, lost his job because of this program. Bill Ford took over as CEO and apologized to the managers in the Wall Street Journal. And once that happened, once Nasser was out and Ford came in with an apology to its managers, they sat down and settled the case for about, I think it was about $10 million 
and, and uh, 500 managers ended the case with a substantial payment and the ABC program was abandoned, although we did find out years later after two more lawsuits against Ford that the ABC program just went underground. They renamed it and they continue to use a ranking system and they continue to use it today. And, uh, and, I was, and <clears throat> in the two additional cases that we've had over the last 15 years, uh, substantial uh, awards have been made to our clients and they still don't get it. They're still using this ranking system, which every time you do it, the statisticians will tell you that the older folks end up on the bottom and the younger people end up at the top. No matter how you cut it, it always ends up that way. Uh, we next worked on the, the Club What's Next case. This is one of Carrie Moss's favorite cases. In that case, 94 people were arrested at a, a Flint uh, nightclub. And they were all arrested for frequent, frequenting a house of uh, ill repute or a house where drugs were sold. And the police came in, this is the Flint uh, police and, the, and uh, Genesee County sheriffs came in and without any particularized suspicion or probable cause, ordered everybody to strip search uh, and then arrested them uh, without proper probable cause. Uh, Ken Mogul and um, Gregory Gibbs, Liz Jacobs, uh, Anne Marie Miller, and others uh, took the case uh, in, in the criminal format, got all the charges dismissed, and our firm spearheaded a damage lawsuit against the law enforcement agencies responsible for this outrageous Fourth Amendment violation. Some of the stories about what happened to these people uh, on the floor of the nightclub that night are just uh, horrendous. And uh, Genesee uh, County and, and the city of Flint ended up paying about $900,000 in damages and uh, entered into a consent judgment where they agreed to train the officers. Dan Karopkin, who is uh, with the ACLU, was in charge of the equitable relief, and he still is fighting with them to this day. He just recently filed a motion to enforce the consent judgment because the city of Flint hasn't done what they promised to do in connection with their training. We next worked on the Saginaw Jail case. This is a, this is a very interesting uh, uh, Fourth Amendment privacy violation. Here, Sheriff Charles Brown of the Saginaw County would take his uh, detainees inside the Saginaw County Jail who were acting in an unruly fashion, strip them of all of their clothes, I mean all of their clothes, and put them in a segregated cell. And would keep them there for a few hours to as, many, to as long as 48 hours. Now imagine what it would be like to be completely naked sitting in a, on a on a cement bench in a freezing cold environment where God knows what is on that bench in terms of you know, human uh, fluids, if you will, uh, with cameras looking at you so that, so that people at the front desk are watching you in this naked condition. Needless to say, um, uh, we were able to secure a substantial decision from Judge Lawson who found this to be an unconstitutional privacy violation. We worked with Lois Fletcher from Flint and Chris Pianto in a collaborative way. And this, this case had the highest possible impact in that uh, Sheriff Brown, who was a Democrat, ran for re-election <coughs> while this case was making headlines in Flint. His opponent in a Democratic primary used this case as an example of why Sheriff Brown should be unseated, and he was successful. And his whole campaign against the sheriff was what he did to these 100 people or more 
in his jail. And the reason Sheriff Brown lost his long-standing position, I think he was there for 20 years or longer, as sheriff was because of the publicity surrounding this lawsuit. And not only were the people of the community outraged by what the sheriff was doing, they ended up paying about a million and a half dollars in damage awards to all of the victims that we could find. And there were, there were we, I think we had 85 people we were able to get awards for, and there must have been hundreds of people who were treated this way. We also worked on the Livingston uh, County Jail case. Here, this was an ACLU case brought to us by Carrie, Carrie Moss. In, the, in Livingston County, back in the 90s, uh, they had a work release program. This is a program where individuals who are charged with crimes and incarcerated are permitted to go to their jobs during the day and are required to come in at, uh, at night to serve their time. The problem was that Livingston County Sheriff only allowed men to take advantage of the work release program. Women who were in a similar situation were denied on a blanket basis any type of work release. So uh, Gary Moss and Mike Steinberg from the ACLU asked us to step in and, and suggested that we team up with a lawyer by the name of Deb LaBelle. But we didn't know, I, didn't, I only knew her by name, but uh, Deb and I and Peggy worked uh, extensively on the case. We um, got to know Deb very well. Uh, we were successful in suing and getting the sheriff to build a separate part of the jail to accommodate the women so that they too could enjoy the work release privileges. In the course of the case, we discovered that there was widespread privacy violations, the way the jail was set up, the male guards would routinely observe the women and make the conditions while they showered and used the toilet. We got them to change those conditions. A class action was approved, a consent judge, judgment was entered, and in addition to all of these changes in the way the jail operated, the uh, sheriff and the county ended up paying about $650,000 to the women who were mistreated in this fashion. Uh, that started uh, a very long and very wonderful association with Deb LaBelle, and that takes us to the Neal case. Uh, in the uh, brochure announcing you know, uh, this, uh, this event, um, <clears throat> probably did an excellent job, but she did misstate uh, one thing. Uh, she said that I led the team of lawyers on the Neal case. That is absolutely not true, <coughs> in all respect, Tova. The, uh, the leader of that gang, if you will, was Deborah Bell. And there's no question that, that this case uh, is part of Deborah Bell's genetic code. I mean, she started in 1996 with Dick Sobel and Molly It was in the uh, Washington County Circuit Court from 1996 until about 2002, 2003, when the state of Michigan had exhausted all of the appeals and the case was ready for trial. At that point, uh, Deb and Dick and Molly looked for civil rights attorneys who were accustomed to working together in a collaborative way that could form a team that would take on this major project. So Peggy and I and Carrie uh, McGee uh, were invited to join that team. Ron Riasta was on the team. Ralph uh, Serlin was on the team. Pat Streeter joined the team. And uh, we, uh, of course, Dick Sobel and Molly Reno joined in. Now that case um, involved uh, sexual assaults and sexual harassment of the female <coughs> inmates that were held in custody by the Michigan Department of Corrections. 
this abuse had been going on since the late 1980s when men were first allowed to act as guards in the female residential units. And that abuse persisted from the late 1980s all the way through the time until the guards were removed in 2009 by order of Judge, uh, I'm sorry, Governor Randall. Uh, the governor ordered the uh, men out of the residential units after the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals decided the Everson case, which was spearheaded by Deborah Bell. In the Everson case, the challenge was brought by the male guards that to deny them the right to work in the female residential units would be a violation of their rights under Title VII, which prohibits gender discrimination. And uh, the Sixth Circuit ruled that uh, it's a bona fide occupational qualification to be a female in a female residential prison environment. And uh, as a result of that, the governor acted fairly promptly and removed the, the men. But before the men were removed, let me uh, kind of summarize what this epic piece of litigation uh, involved. Uh, in January of 2008, there was a jury trial in Washtenaw County Circuit Court. That case lasted about four weeks. And in that case, the um, uh, women who were then in court, there were, I think there were 10 women who were the initial plaintiffs, brought forth their stories of really what amounted to torture. Uh, these, these are women who were incarcerated, some for short sentences, some for life. Uh, they described in great detail how they were abused by the male guards in the most horrific way you might imagine. The, the claims range from uh, touching, uh, verbal harassment, to actual rapes. And the jury heard it all. They heard every, every bit of it. The um, sexual misconduct occurred from 1993, 1993 through 1998. The warden at the Scott Correctional Facility, which was the facility that we uh, was under trial at that time, admitted that she was fully aware of the sexually hostile, intimidating conditions uh, and uh, was aware that uh, the Human Rights Watch, a respected international organization, had actually come into the prison, reviewed conditions, and wrote a report describing the conditions as akin to torture. She admitted that she knew that the women were being tortured by the men, but did nothing to prevent it or to abate it. The jury was, was very, very much moved by this testimony and very, very moved by the, the lack of concern and the indifference of the, the state officials. And um, at the um, conclusion of the case, the jury awarded uh, some $15 million to these 10 women, and with interest and <coughs> fees, that award uh, reached about $30 million. Now, I told her made another error in her introduction. I apologize again. She said that the, the state officials apologized to the women. Well, that never happened. That did not happen. To this day, they've never apologized. What happened was the jury was so moved by what had happened to these women that they apologized on behalf of the state of Michigan for what these women had gone through. I mean, they asked the judge. This is very extraordinary because typically the jury speaks through its verdict. But they asked the judge for special permission to make a statement to the woman. And I still get emotional thinking about it because it was such a, a terrific moment in our lawyer's life to see uh, how you could move a jury to the point where they 
react, not as jurors, but as human beings, to see what had happened to these women. And, and they, they, they got it. They understood that it's not like a sex harassment case in an employment setting where the victim can leave and go back to the shelter of their home. These women were trapped. And the, and the cruelty of what was going on was, was unspeakable, unspeakable. But the jury spoke. And the apology uh, that was rendered by the jury on behalf of the people of the state of Michigan was something that I will never forget. You would think that the state would throw in the towel after the first verdict, but they didn't. Um, we had to try a second case. And so by the end of 2008, the second case started. This time we had seven women. And uh, after another month of trials, uh, the a different jury, but a jury of similar-minded folks, awarded seven women uh, about $12 million which added up to about $24 million. Now mind you, this is all taxpayer dollars. Every penny of it is taxpayer dollars. And um, the um, state um, still didn't get it. <laughs> they appealed the first verdict to the Michigan Court of Appeals. And the, the Michigan Court of Appeals said that the, the trial was a fair trial and they expressed outrage with the way the state handled the, the uh, criminally hostile prison environment that they had created on behalf of uh, attacking all these women. And they took that case to the Michigan Supreme Court. The Michigan Supreme Court denied leave. At that point, they got it. And they realized that their belief that jurors would never, ever, give substantial amounts of money to these criminals. I mean, some of the plaintiffs were in prison for murder. The first degree murderers uh, were awarded, you know, a million dollars or more in some cases. The jurors were totally uh, with us and, and did not in any way, shape, manner, or form accept any of the state's arguments that these were undeserving plaintiffs or that these, these women had actually brought on these problems themselves. And so Dick Sobel and um, uh, Deborah Bell entered into settlement negotiations with the state of Michigan and by 2009 the historic $100 million settlement was reached. Um, I just want to just give you uh, a little bit of some of the evidence that was uh, presented to the jury. The Department of Justice came in and did uh, brought their own lawsuit against the uh, state of Michigan and said in its report, nearly every inmate we interviewed reported various sexually aggressive acts by the guards. Scott officers abused women inmates during pat-down searches by routinely touching all parts of the woman's body, including fondling and squeezing their breasts products and genital areas in a ways not justified by legitimate security needs. Uh, as a ward of the state, every aspect of an inmate's life is controlled by prison employees. When she sleeps, wakes, dresses, and eats, recreation, education, and freedom of movement are at the discretion of the staff. And the guards knew this and exploited these women in a sexual way so that they could, would be denied opportunity to see their families or to engage in educational treatment. The Sixth Circuit, in commenting about the conditions at the prison, wrote in the Everson opinion, the problem of sexual abuse and other mistreatment of female inmates has long played the Michigan Department of Corrections. It said, additionally, evidence presented in the trial indicates that sexual misconduct may be underreported. <coughs> the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals 
by no means a liberal organization, stated in its opinion, Michigan's deplorable record regarding the care of its female inmates, which, absent evidence of the contrary, must uh, sets it apart from all other states. So, the Michigan Department of Corrections was rebuked by two juries by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals, the governor, and finally, they ended up in resolving the case uh, at significant cost, not only to the taxpayers, but to the women who had to endure years of abuse, even after this case was filed. I mean, from 1996 until it was concluded in 2009, this lawsuit was pending, and woman, woman, after, woman after woman after woman was continuing to be sexually abused. During the life of this case, it made no difference to these state administrators and state employees whether they were going to someday have to be accountable for their actions. So that case uh, really uh, was a capstone of, of my career and represents uh, really the, the best example of how high impact litigation through collaboration with civil rights attorneys can make a difference. Now, let me talk about some of the lessons that I've learned along the way. Uh, certain, certain civil rights organizations exist to litigate civil rights cases. Unlike those civil rights groups dedicated to advancing the cause through policy change, change uh, organizations like the Sugar Law Center, ACLU of Michigan, and Public Justice to foster real change through the work through courtroom warriors like the individuals who I described here today. Uh, collaboration is the, the key to the success. By far, my greatest collaboration has been members of my firm, both past and present. Uh, our firm was founded in 1992 by Stu Dowdy and Carrie McGee. Carrie, you want to stand up and be recognized? <laughs> my wife, Peggy, who is also a founding member. Peggy. Uh, Jeannie Meyer, who I, uh, I mentioned earlier, joined the firm and was with us about eight years. Bob Palmer joined about 12 years ago now? 10. 10 years. Bob, I'm going to stand and be recognized. Uh, Jack Rivers joined us about 10 years ago also. Is that here? He's not here. Um, Kevin Carlson joined about five years ago. I don't think Kevin's here. And uh, Megan Bonani joined about 10. 10 years, stand up, Megan. Andrea Johnson just joined the firm. She served as a law clerk to Judge uh, Victoria Roberts for about two years. She joined some years. <laughs> Jennifer Gross is our third year law student uh, who has been with us for about a, about a year now, almost a year. Not quite. She's <laughs> <laughs> doing very well and making a real contribution to the firm. Um, the firm's motto, we have a motto in our firm. It really is, we can do well by doing good. And that really has been the story of my life as a civil rights attorney. Every one of the cases that I described, except for the Williams International case, um, has generate, generated what I call an enabling fee. The enabling fee means that you work, you work your butt off, uh, you, you create a, a, a terrific result, not only for your clients, but for the community at large. And you get an enabling fee, which means you, it enables you to do the next case. And that, that's really what it's all about, is, is picking the cases where you can do uh, good work and you can um, actually do well from a business lawsuit uh, law firm activity. 
and uh, all the cases that I've described for you has uh, been the work of uh, fine attorneys I've worked with over the years, and I'm proud to say we generated an enabling fee to allow us to continue to do this kind of work. Now, what is the, uh, the future? Uh, one of my activities is to sponsor the Mark Weiss Memorial Scholarship at Wayne State. This is a scholarship named after uh, a colleague of ours who died prematurely. And he worked in the public interest sector. And this scholarship has been in existence about eight or nine years now. And uh, every year, a group of us have the privilege of going through the applications for the scholarship awards. And I look forward to doing that because I see in writing the next generation. They, they lay out uh, for us uh, where they have been and where they hope to go in the world of public interest. And I'm telling you, these people are out there. They want to do this kind of work. They need to do this kind of work. There are some lawyers that are bred, that are born to do this kind of work. And they're right here in our community. Wayne State Law School through Dean Ackerman has listened to lawyers like myself, uh, encouraging him to make Wayne State Law School a center for public interest law and training. And he's responded, and he's created fellowships. And we have one of, one of the fellows right here. And Wayne State is slowly becoming known nationwide as a training ground for public interest lawyers. And there are disadvantaged people in this community that far exceed other parts of the country. There are problems that we have in this uh, community with access to justice that uh, really dwarf the problems in other communities. And, this, and the young people coming to Wayne State know that. And they want to get involved in the cure. They want to fix things. And so there, there are uh, many, many people out there who want to do this kind of work. And I want the message to get out that our motto at our firm does live. You can do well by doing good. It is true. And we're living proof of it. And the, and the young public interest lawyers need to get that message across to them. But it doesn't happen by itself. When I started in the 70s, there were no uh, organizations dedicated to high impact litigation. The Sugar Law Center didn't exist until the 1990s. The American Civil Liberties Union did exist, but it was always kind of a fledgling group that uh, kind of lived on the uh, kindness of others, if you will, until Kerry Moss took it and made it into the powerhouse that it is. It is now a one of the nation's best and well-known high-impact civil rights litigation organizations. These organizations do fill the void that was created by the demise of the, of the Goodman firm and some of the other firms that used to do the high impact civil litigation no longer exist. Our firm is stepping in and is filling some of the void, but we certainly can't do it all. So it's these great organizations that are breeding civil rights warriors fighting the good fight in the courtroom that is the new wave of how public interest law is going to be advanced. So if you're an attorney, let me uh, tell you what I think you can do to protect individual liberties during the difficult times ahead. Uh, recognize <coughs> that you can handle important civil rights litigation and earn fees which will enable you to sustain your practice. 
locate, hire, and train junior attorneys who want to work in this field. Team up with other civil rights attorneys to tackle the high, lit high impact litigation case. Serve as volunteer counsel with the organizations dedicated to change through, litiga change through litigation. And of course, financially support organizations like the Sugar Law Center uh, who are uh, committed to doing this kind of work. Uh, if you are not an attorney, here's what you can do. Speak to your community groups, labor unions, or other grassroots organizations and make them aware of the role of high impact civil rights lit litigation in protecting individual rights and addressing corporate and governmental abuse. Look for ways to associate yourself or your local groups with organizations like the Sugar Law Center so that appropriate cases are brought forward and developed for litigation. These groups are always in the hunt for new cases. And that's, that's important. Those of you who are not lawyers, who believe there are societal problems that need to be addressed, you need to bring them forward. Bring them to the civil rights attorneys. Bring them to the organizations. These organizations are always looking for new cases to develop. And you as community leaders, it's part of your responsibility to bring those cases forward so that the professionals who work with these civil rights organizations can assess them and develop them for litigation. Volunteer to work for organizations sponsoring the litigation or work on the, the legal teams fighting a case that you're interested in. Uh, in the Neal case, for instance, we had teams, I mean teams of volunteers. Many of them were law students from Ann Arbor, University of Michigan. Many of them were non-lawyers and non-law students who heard about the case, stepped forward and volunteered, and spent hours going through records. I mean records that would fill for half of this room Somebody had to read these records, analyze them, and come up with summaries of them. This all required hours and hours of people hours to, to develop these cases. And we were successful in part due to, the, to, the, the, to the, the good work of many of the volunteers who stepped forward on that case. And of course, if you're a non-lawyer, financially support the Sugar the Law Center and other groups uh, of that type. So, you basically have now heard uh, some of the highlights of, of my life as a civil rights attorney. Uh, I've enjoyed it immensely. I've made uh, a decent living doing this kind of work. I've been able to give back to the legal profession as best I can, as best as Peggy and I have been able to do. And uh, I look forward to many, many more years of uh, fighting a good fight. Thank you. Leonard Grossman speaker. I don't know if you want to read that to folks and share at least the top part of what it says. As we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Very well said. Now, Nelson,